I think we have a strong indication that the market's rolling over. Tie that with the fact that it's been a very, very long bull market, and then the inverted yield curve. And you have, I think, a very reasonable expectation that markets are coming down, stock market and bond market are coming down, and the yield curve indicates that a recession is coming. And of course, sometime in the next, in 2019, somebody will announce, yep, the recession started way back when, and now we're going to have to deal with it. Are you tired of overpaying for your gold, silver, and platinum bullion coins and bars? Then visit sdbullion.com today. SD Bullion was recently named the 177th fastest growing company in the United States by Inc. Magazine. This is because they offer the absolute lowest prices in the industry and follow up with over the top customer service. So what are you waiting for? Go to sdbullion.com today. Enjoy more than 60,000 happy investors that save money on every precious metals purchase they make. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with SilverDoctors.com and back with us today is Gary Christensen from TheDeviantInvestor.com. Gary, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for having me on. Definitely. We always love having you on and the first topic I'd like to discuss is something um, really, it seems like really important, the inversion of the yield curve. Essentially, long-term rates are going below... Um, uh, short-term rates, and specifically the five-year um, rate versus the two-year rate. And every recession since the 1950s has been preceded by a similar, you know, inversion of the yield curve. So what do you think the significance of this is today? Well, I have two comments on that. First of all, <clears throat> I do think it's significant. Um, if the yield curve, the total yield curve hasn't inverted, that would be where the 30-year yield comes down below, say, the three-month. And that, I believe, has happened in the past. That, of course, that's really an inverted yield curve. Right now, we just have a piece of the curve that's inverted. But, you know, that shows that there's more concern about short-term money than long-term money. And normally, long-term money should attract a higher interest rate. But when the yield curve inverts, that means the long-term money is attracting a lower interest rate, or at least a similar interest rate. To the short-term money, that's usually a very bad sign. And as you said, that's a mark. That's an indication of a coming recession. Um, <clears throat> there's, of course, disagreement on that. And the the caveat I have to this whole thing is, we've had ten years roughly of central bank intervention on interest rates, dropping interest rates in this country for the Fed funds rate to the zero and the T bond rate down to the 10-year rate down to like uh, uh, 144 in uh, middle 2016. So, you know, I think that it's safe to say that the, the various central banks, and that includes the European Central Bank where they dropped interest rates below zero, have intruded into this field substantially. What that means is in terms of the inverted yield curve is I think that we have to say every time in history it's looked like a recession is coming, but how much has this been affected by central bank intervention? And I can't answer that question. I do want to add a couple other things, though, about a coming recession. The stock market has been going up for a long, long time and is showing serious signs of rolling over. If you look at March charts of the S&P or the Dow, you can see that it peaked. In fact, I think the Dow really peaked in January at a secondary similar high uh, not too long ago. But it, the momentum has been weak for the Dow since, uh, since January. Um, the NASDAQ, of course, has held up better. The FANG stocks have held up. But then all of a sudden, the FANG stocks have crashed. I think we have a strong indication that the market's rolling over. Tie that with the fact that it's been a very, very long bull market. And then the inverted yield curve. And you have, I think, a very reasonable expectation that markets are coming down, stock market and bond market are coming down, and 
the yield curve indicates that a recession is coming. And of course, sometime in the next, in 2019, somebody will announce, yep, the recession started way back when, and now we're going to have to deal with it. And I think that that also ties in with the Fed raising rates. You know, they've talked about raising rates through December and then pushing the rates even higher in 2019 and 2020. And in, in in the opinion of many, including myself, the Fed created most of these problems by creating all this uh, funny money that has been printed up from nothing, QE. And so then they need to raise rates so they can ride to the rescue and look like the good guys as they drop interest rates and help the economy again out of the, to solve the problem they created. So I think we have a number of conflicting features here, but right now they appear to be rolling over into the direction of recession and stock market correction. And of course, who wants to hear that news? Uh, yeah, and I mean, looking at just technically at the chart of the Dow, you mentioned how the stock market seems to be rolling over. You know, we are seeing, uh, you know, it, it peaked uh, at an all-time high on October 3rd, and now we saw, you know, it go down and then make a lower high and now then a lower low another lower high it just made and then we might be headed for a lower low so can you talk about maybe how the markets look technically right now well technically i think they look very weak you know at any time in a massive bear market you can have huge rallies and some of the biggest rallies in the history of the dow have been during bear markets during crashes and then the uh, a period of time where you get short covering and a period of time where um, the market rallies again but some so the point is that some of the biggest rallies occur during bear markets so we shouldn't interpret those rallies as everything is wonderful or everything is safe i think it is clear that the market's rolling over i think it is a process and by that i mean perhaps the dow goes first and like you said the, the all-time high was in october but the that was really almost a secondary high compared to the momentum high that occurred in january so the dow goes first maybe um uh, the Amazon stock hit 2050 uh, not too long ago. Maybe Amazon stock is one of the last to go. Facebook got pounded long before Amazon did. But another example of this, look at GE. GE hit their high a couple of years ago. And if you look at the chart of GE, it looks very much like the chart of the S&P, except that GE is peaking and falling much more rapidly. I think GE is now down to $7 and something. And that's down in the neighborhood of 25% of what it used to be uh, not very long ago. I think GE is just a forerunner of the S&P and the Dow. Another example would be Deutsche Bank. How on earth can Deutsche Bank be in the $8 or $9 range when it was $100 uh, 10 years ago? And the answer is people are worried about derivatives and about the long-term viability of that bank. And since it's a, such a huge player, that causes worry in all markets. Definitely. And can you get into that, why it is such a worry in other markets? Like, um, what other markets specifically are you talking about? Well, uh, <clears throat> The 2008 crash occurred largely because of, in very round numbers, a trillion dollars worth of mortgage-backed securities that uh, started imploding. But we have substantially more than that now in derivatives, you know, credit default swaps and so forth, that um, are vulnerable. And every derivative is tied in one way or another, usually quite tightly, to the interest rate. So when interest rates start rising, as they are now and have been for about two and a half years, then that puts more pressure on those derivative contracts. And what happens when the derivative contracts start to weaken? Somebody calls for margin, margin calls occur, occur, and then like in 2008, you start selling everything in sight that's liquid to protect the, the illiquid investments you have to meet the margin calls, hoping that it'll all turn around pretty soon. And of course, it always does turn around. I mean, history shows that the market goes up, the market goes down. It's black at the bottom, and everybody's opt uh, pessimistic and worried. At the top, everyone's optimistic. These cycles occur. The catch is in calling them and picking when the tops are and when the bottoms are. But the point is that when the markets are going down, when interest rates are rising, then you find out where the pressures are. Who is going to have trouble meeting that margin call? Who's going to go bankrupt? Who's going to have to sell off good assets? which drives the stock market and the bond markets down further in order to protect their bad assets that they can't sell that are illiquid, that they hope to be able to sell at some point in the future. All of these pressures, these derivative pressures, put um, 
stress into an already very leveraged market. If you look at the total um, um, debt for margin, margin debt on the New York Stock Exchange, it's huge. It's high. It's high as a percentage of the market and it's high as a percentage of GDP. There's so much debt, so much leverage in the system that it doesn't take too much to push it over the edge. And I'm afraid that's where we are right now. And sometimes you get to a point where it really doesn't matter what the actual stimulus is, what the the um, the, the last point that caused the problem. It just matters that the system is unstable. And systems become unstable when you have too much debt. So we have too much debt. We have a very old market. We have FANG stocks, which are the leaders now rolling over and being pounded, you know, 20 percent, 30 percent, 40 percent down. And, you know, what is surprising about a FANG stock going down when their P.E. is 200 or 300 or 400 to 1, which is high by a factor of 10 at least. So there's no surprise that these things happen. What's surprising is that people believe that the market will go up forever and ever and ever when in the past it never does. So we have to consider that all of these stimuluses could push the market over the edge, but really at the fundamental level, it starts with instability in the marketplace, instability in derivatives, instability in overpriced stocks, instability in overpriced bonds, all thanks to Federal Reserve easy money and undue optimism and probably some serious levitation by market by uh, stock buybacks and such that elevate the market and then make it unstable and vulnerable to a downturn. And then the downturn can turn into a waterfall crash. We're not there yet, but it could happen. I'm not saying it will, but it certainly could. We all remember the carnage from 2008. Right. And in 2008, the stock market fell more than 50%. Are you expecting a similar um, thing to happen this time? Well, I I am, but I base that more on uh, the work of John Houseman, who is uh, John Houseman, who is actually you know a brilliant man and has done some very good statistics going back well over a hundred years. He's looking for a decline in the neighborhood of two thirds on the stock market, and. Um, historically speaking, that's not surprising. The Dow fell um, considerably in 2008. The S&P was down, as I remember, about 55%. But uh, other stocks fell 90%, 80%. If you remember the NASDAQ after the 2000 crash, uh, the NASDAQ 100, and I'm p- talking from peak to low, from high to low, uh, fell 84%. So the NASDAQ 100, the whole index fell over 80% after the 2000 high. And that was a horrible uh, peak and bubble, just like we've seen now in the FANG stocks and such. I wouldn't be surprised to see the FANG stocks drop 80 to 90%. And then, of course, rebound and come back up. Another point of history, Amazon stock fell over 90% during that 2000 crash. It could happen again. I'm not saying it will, but it could happen again. But what is very likely, in my opinion, is that we're looking for a period of weakness in the next months and probably several years in the stock market and probably some major Fed intervention following that. No, looking at um, now the precious metal markets, how do you see these um, the inverted yield curve and this possible, uh, you know, recession and stock market crash coming ahead. How will precious <clears throat> metals respond? Well, <clears throat> I'm a precious metals bull, and so I believe that precious metals are going to respond positively. But there might be some short-term weakness. <clears throat> I say that because in 2008, when the stock markets crashed, people were selling everything in sight, good assets as well as bad assets, to make the margin calls, and that drove everything down. And silver and gold hit a low, major low in 2008. They also hit a major low in December of 2015, and that's about the time the Fed started cranking up interest rates. The traditional story is that interest rate rises are bad for gold and silver, but I don't really think history proves that out. If you look at 2015, the the silver and gold prices rallied after that. I believe that the Fed increasing interest rates is not going to hurt precious metals. But what I believe will really help precious metals is the fact that eventually people are going to remember silver and gold have no liability. They're not dependent on an interest rate. They're not dependent on somebody buying back stocks. They're not dependent on somebody's credibility or interest rate or uh, uh, 
their their re- revenue from a, a business. They exist as they are, and they've been valuable for several thousand years and will remain valuable. So if you look at ratios, because I think ratios is important to give you a perspective on where the markets are. <clears throat> Look at the ratio of silver or gold, but I'll talk about silver, to the S&P, to the Dow, to M2, to national debt, to total debt outstanding, um, to um, any of several others. And you see that in by those measures, silver is very, very undervalued compared to those markets. Those markets have been levitated and boosted up because the paper markets are where all the action is, and so people – Push those markets high, but silver has been left in the dust. Remember that silver went from $4.01 in November of 2001 to over $48 in April of 2011. You know, that's a, a rise of 12 times. Silver could rise again substantially. I'm not saying 12 times, but it could rise again substantially from here because it's so undervalued compared to all those other markets. And what happens when people realize Amazon is falling? The Dow is falling. They're crashing. Things are not good. The Federal Reserve is raising rates. Maybe I should move some of my capital into something safer. And right now, the bond market doesn't look so safe. The stock market doesn't look so safe. Real estate is rolling over. Houses aren't selling. What's safe? And it's gold and silver. Gold and silver are safe. And they are undervalued right now. They're very cheap particularly silver, is very cheap. And so why wouldn't some money roll into those markets? Of course, the Federal Reserve doesn't want to see that, and a lot of the powers that be don't want to see that, but pretty soon the market will overwhelm those resisting forces and push silver and gold much higher. That's my opinion. Now, with the slowing economy, are you concerned at all about silver because of silver's uh, tie to industry, right? It has a lot of industrial use. And if that falls What will happen to silver? Are you concerned about that at all? Um, That's a small concern, and I think that's a very good point that you bring up. Silver is tied to industry, but the major thing that's going to drive silver higher, in my opinion, is investment demand. And that's the point I'm talking about, about when people worry about where do I put my money. And even if you're only moving 5% of your capital into silver, that can make a substantial move in silver. That's investment demand. Maybe in, maybe industrial demand drops off a little bit because we fall into a recession. But if investment demand more than triples from there, it will make up for it and push um, the price higher. Another factor to consider is oil. Oil prices are, in my opinion, very difficult to predict. I don't know what's going on with the oil market. They seem to be up one day and down another day. But oil or energy is a major factor in the cost of production of gold and silver. So if the price of oil is going up, the cost of production of of gold and silver is going up. What I'd be more worried about is not the recession. I'd be more worried about a collapse in the price of oil prices. If we saw a collapse in the oil prices, how would that impact the economy? Well, I, you know, on the one hand, it's going to um, – everybody's going to be happy. It's cheaper at the gas pump. I mean, who doesn't like $2 a gallon gasoline? But how many of those shale, shale oil companies that have hundreds of billions of dollars of debt will go under – or be unable to pay back that debt when the price of oil collapses. I think that's a huge factor, and I think that uh, energy is a major industrial importance in this world, and particularly in the U.S. economy. If the prices of, of oil collapse, then I'm afraid that there's going to be a lot of, of um, bankruptcies and uh, defaulted debt in the energy sector. That, I think, is a f- very big factor, and I am hoping that does not occur, but – You know, we don't know. Uh, Seems to me that oil prices ought to be rising because we have um, more money being printed, more dollars chasing goods. Inflation is obviously rising. Um, Maybe temporarily oil prices are floundering here, but I expect to see higher oil prices in in several years. I might be dead wrong on that, but that would be the worry I would have is collapsing oil prices will, I think, trash a lot of, of debt in this country, and I would hope that doesn't happen. All right. Well, Gary Christensen, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers maybe um, some ways that they can protect themselves from if we are going to see this economic crisis ahead and then also where they can find your insights online? Okay. Well, 
as I said, I'm a gold and silver bull. I'm believe I believe in the value of gold and silver, um, and I believe that it's a good um, way to protect yourself. It's insurance, and I believe it's a good way to protect yourself. And I don't mean that as a 100% all the time. Obviously, you don't want to buy gold in 1980 and watch it drop. 70% or buy silver in 1980 and watch it drop 90%. There's a time to buy everything, including Amazon stock, Facebook stock, and silver. I think today is the time to not be buying Amazon or Facebook. I think today is the time to be buying gold and silver. And I think that you should go to a reputable dealer. You can find my writing um, on deviantinvestor.com, and I usually put on an article or two every week, and I have other articles that I think are uh, important. I'm not trying to overload anyone, but I just think there's things that are important that need to be said, and I try to say them on deviantinvestor.com. Thank you. Once again, thank you so much for your time, Gary. You're welcome. 